I like to say that I grew up south of the tracks. Matter of fact, I grew up south of two sets of tracks. Uh, when I turned into the ministry, people looked at me and said, "You is not." You know, I I feel like my whole ministry has been a Rodney Dangerfield ministry. I get no respect. But Jesus had to face some of that too. And so I feel like it puts me in good company. So we're going to look this morning at John chapter 7. We're going to begin at verse 14. Remember last week, Jesus' brothers were trying to talk him to go down to Jerusalem for the festival and present himself as king and and use the festival to garner a lot of, of people coming to his banner and so that he would cast out the Romans and become the great king after David. He didn't go. But he did go after everybody else left and did it in secret. So we pick up with that at verse 14. Not until halfway through the festival did Jesus go up to the temple courts and began to teach. The Jews there were amazed and asked, How did this man get such learning without having been taught? Jesus answered, My teaching is not my own. It comes from the one who sent me. Anyone who chooses to do the will of God will find out whether my teaching comes from God or whether I speak on my own. Whoever speaks on their own does so to gain personal glory. But he who seeks the glory of the one who sent him is a man of truth. There's nothing false about him. Let's pray. Father, help us to receive the words of Jesus, but help us also to live the words he said, that we seek not our personal glory, but we seek the glory of you who sent us. Teach us, lead us, glorify your name through us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Jesus came from south of the tracks as well. Uh, Galilee was, well, if you were in England, Scotland is where the hillbillies live. If you're in America, the Appalachians are where the hillbillies live. In Israel, Galilee is where the hillbillies live. So we talked a little bit about that last week. There are, in this passage, and you saw the first one in verse 15, the Jews say to him, or say, how can he get this kind of learning? I mean, he's never been taught. There's three designated groups in this passage. In verse 15, you have the Jews. In verse 20, you have the crowd. And in verse 25, you have the people of Jerusalem. Now, John doesn't do this anywhere else in his gospel. And so it means something when he designates it like this. And so I just want to set that up for you. So as we go, you'll be seeing that. So the Jews, the leadership, are questioning, good grief, how, how can he teach like that? He doesn't have any training. He doesn't have any background. Now, Jesus is still not committed to self-promoting. He's not doing that. He waits until the festival is half over, and then he goes quietly into the temple courts and begins teaching. He's not the only one doing that. All around the temple, covered porches, around the outside, rabbis are teaching. That's where Jesus went when he was 12 years old and began talking with the rabbis and answering questions. It's the same kind of thing. That's where those kinds of things were done in the temple court, I mean the covered courts surrounding the temple. Now, obviously, as a boy, Jesus had taken Hebrew lessons. And they probably had some sort of school there at the synagogue in Nazareth, where he grew up. However, he never formally studied under a rabbi. When you, when you go to the book of Acts, you find that Paul had come from Tarsus to Jerusalem to study at the feet of Gamaliel. That's the way they, they put that. He was formally a student of the great rabbi Gamaliel. And lots of rabbis, that's the way they did it, as long as they were wealthy enough to A, pay the rabbi, B, 
support themselves while they were doing that. Jesus didn't do that. Now, the Jews, the leadership, they were proud of that. That, that, that training, that I sat under Gamaliel, I sat under Hillel, I sat under the great rabbis. They're proud of that and they took offense at what they see as Jesus' presumption of knowledge. Who does he think he is? They questioned his competence. And the joke is, he had a better teacher than any of them. His teaching comes from the one who sent him, God the Father. I, I laugh because the Jews question Jesus' competence as teacher, and he turns around and questions their competence as hearers. What you can't you can't receive it unless it comes from God. You're not receiving it? Oh, that might be a problem. Not everyone can teach well. But everyone can listen, hear the word of God, and receive it. You don't have to be a genius to receive the word of God. When John Bunyan wrote Pilgrim's Progress, he had no formal education. Everything he had education-wise was from his mother teaching him at home. He didn't have any schooling at all. And yet, he wrote a book that's still on the world's bestseller list today. Why? Well, he put it this way. Being a Christian is an education. And it's true. Being, serving God, you learn from God. You don't just learn spiritually, but you learn about people. You learn about yourself. You learn about life. It's a growth experience. You learn. And Jesus is telling them that. What's wrong with you guys? He never sought his own glory, but in everything he did, he sought the glory of the Father. And that's what he's trying to say to them. Why are you guys so upset about what I know instead of wondering what God wants to teach you? Okay, that's, this is the pastoral moment. This is where you and I need to be. We don't need to be, what's God doing with that person? Why is God blessing them and not blessing me? Why are all these things happening to them and I'm just sitting here and nothing's happening to me? Am I open to God? Am I seeking from God? Am I reading the Word? Am I praying? Am I spending time seeking God? Or am I just waiting? Okay, God, dump it on me. Something to think about. If you're not a vessel ready to receive, why why would you think God would give you anything? Verse 19. Jesus is st still speaking. Has not Moses given you the law? Yet not one of you keeps the law. Why are you trying to kill me? Here's the second designated group. You're demon-possessed, the crowd answered. Who's trying to kill you? <coughs> Jesus said, I did one miracle and you're all amazed. Yet, because Moses gave you circumcision, who so actually didn't come from Moses, but from the patriarchs, you circumcise a boy on the Sabbath. Now, if a boy can be circumcised on the Sabbath so that the law of Moses may not be broken, why are you angry with me for healing a man's whole body on the Sabbath? Stop judging by mere appearances, but instead judge correctly. Hmm. He, he jumps right in their face here. He accused the leadership of a murderous plot trying to kill him. And the crowd's incredulous. What? Now, the crowd means it's not the Jewish leadership and it's not his disciples. It's the people standing there in the temple court listening to this interchange between Jesus and the Jewish leadership. Who's trying to kill you? You're demon possessed, man. What's going on? I don't get that. They can't believe that of their leaders. What? He wouldn't do that. And yet, that's exactly what was going on. They were trying to have Jesus done away with. They just had to do it in such a way that they didn't get their hands dirty doing it. That they still looked good and felt good to themselves doing it. He 
Jesus' his response pretty much is, you, you can't believe anybody's trying to hurt me? Then he reminds them of the antagonism that he received when he healed a man on the Sabbath. And he takes it into circumcision being done on the Sabbath. He says, why is this okay, but this is not okay? Circumcision, like healing, is the epitome of wholeness. Being in a right relationship with God, a symbol of that. But circumcision is only a symbol of wholeness. Healing is both physical wholeness and a symbol of spiritual wholeness. So Jesus is saying, you're, you're, you're upset because I healed a man on the Sabbath. You circumcise on the Sabbath. That's supposed to be in a relationship with God. I healed a man's whole body. Isn't that in a good relationship with God? Now, to be honest with you and to be truthful, Jews today will tell you that it's okay to heal a man on the Sabbath, to get your animal out of a ditch on the Sabbath, to do good on the Sabbath is a good thing. They learn. Okay, but at that time, sticking point, they didn't like that at all. Jesus wasn't rejecting the Sabbath. He's fulfilling the Sabbath. Healing a man's body, what a great thing to do in God's name on the Sabbath. He wasn't, you know, setting up office hours and putting out a Dr. Jesus plaque and collecting money. He wasn't working. Verse 25. At this point, here's the third group, some of the people of Jerusalem began to ask, isn't this the man they're trying to kill? Here he is speaking publicly, and they're not saying a word to him. Have the authorities really concluded that he's the Messiah? But we know where this man's from. When the Messiah comes, no one will know where he's from. Then Jesus, still teaching in the temple courts, cried out, Yes, you know me, and you know where I'm from. I'm not here on my own authority, but he who sent me is true. You do not know me. Him, but I know him because I am from him and he sent me. Now there's a bunch of stuff going on here. The people of Jerusalem is different than the Jewish leadership and it's different than the crowd that's gathered around him. It's people that are walking by going, hey, what's going on over there? And then they start talking, hey. And it's funny because the crowd goes, oh, you got, you're demon possessed, who's trying to kill you? People walking by are going, hey, isn't that the guy that's trying to kill? <laughs> I just there's just so much irony wrapped up in this passage. It's kind of funny. Now these people had no part in the group around that's around Jesus here. But never mind the Jews, the crowd, the people of Jerusalem. What you've got in those three groups, everybody's thinking and talking about Jesus. For whatever reason. And he went there in secret and yet still the whole the, the idea is the whole city of Jerusalem is thinking and talking about Jesus. You kind of get the impression sometimes when you see movies about Jesus or, or hear uh, read stories and stuff that his ministry was so small that only a very few people knew about him. Well, that's not true. He had the Jewish leadership was right. He had the whole countryside up and on. Everybody was talking about Jesus. Who is he really? And the people here walking by are saying, do the leaders think he's the Messiah? Whoa! They're wondering, is this man the Messiah? And Jesus, having stepped away from the conquering king picture, this is confusing everyone. They're wondering, how can this be? What's going on? And then they go, well, wait a minute. <clears throat> when Messiah comes, nobody will know where he's coming from, but we know where this guy's from. He's from Nazareth. Well, number one, nowhere in Scripture does it say no one knows where the Messiah comes. And and the prophecy that was given to Herod was he comes from Bethlehem. So I mean somebody knows where he's from. But it's this is popular religion that these people are doing. This is not theology. Nobody knows where the Messiah is coming from. Oh, wait a minute. But Nazareth is a stumbling block 
Wait a minute. Can any good thing come from Nazareth? What? I don't believe that. How could that be? If God was going to choose, raise up the Messiah, wouldn't it be somebody like Gamaliel or Hillel? A great rabbi? Wouldn't it be a great warrior? Wouldn't it be somebody <clears throat> from Jerusalem? Somebody important? Not some hillbilly from Nazareth. Not a country bumpkin. Can any good thing come from Nazareth? The answer is, come and see. That's the answer that uh, Philip gave to Nathaniel when he asked that question. Come and see. And that's the thing about Jesus. You can look at him from a distance. You can mock him. We today, you know, we can laugh about wearing bathrobes and walking around and, you know, being silly and being religious and all. But the fact is, when you come into Jesus' sphere of influence, when you open your mind to his mind through the scriptures, even the most jaded, intellectual, anti-God people have been known to bow before him and receive him. We're in a hostile climate to religion right now. And yet, people still turn to Christ. People still give their lives to Him. Do not be influenced by the news. By what you see and hear in the media. Don't be intimidated by that. This just happens to be, there's always a pendulum swing sociologically. When I was a teenager, it was cool to be a Christian. Now, especially among teenagers, it's not cool to be a Christian. It's just a pendulum swing of social things. There were a lot of people that I knew in school that wanted to be a cool Christian, and as soon as it wasn't cool anymore, they stopped. I think the same is true of atheism. It's just a cool thing. Jesus is eternal. If you look at him, if you listen to him, if you ask, Jesus said, seek from him who sent me, you'll learn. You'll know. Jesus waves the geographic question. Nazareth, he doesn't care. Yeah, you know me. He points out, you know me, but there are things you don't know about me either. And you can't know unless you know God. If you know God, you recognize Jesus. Because... Jesus is the living, breathing image of God. If you don't know God, look at Jesus. If you want to know what God's like, look at what Jesus says. Look at what Jesus does. That's what God says and does. Because Jesus does the will of him who sent him. But here's the question. Do you recognize Jesus? Do you look at Jesus? Or are you just passing him by because he's not cool? Father, glorify yourself through our lives. Lord, oftentimes we don't do great and mighty things. We just do little daily things. But the compassion we show people who are hurting, the help we give people who are in need, those are images of you. Those are done in your name and for your glory. And we pray, Father, that even in those small little daily things, that you would touch lives, touch hearts, and turn people to look at Jesus. And we pray in his holy name. Amen.